Uh, what's the actual name of the group in Paris? Zissou Heritage. Zissou Heritage. Okay. I'll let you explain all of okay. there. Okay. What you got going on? Now. Well, thanks for the opportunity to uh, be here. It's a real pleasure. Uh, as Steve mentioned, uh, <coughs> I am part of a group named Sisu Heritage. Sisu Heritage is a uh, regional historical society for Embarrass and about four or five of the other surrounding townships, Wasset, Pike, Sandy, Kugler. Uh, I'm going to start uh, by introducing a couple of people that have been part of this project. Uh, and, and a couple of players. One is Leon Graff um, from Ely, and one is our uh, log, log restoration contractor, Matt Fadden. Um, and they are a great source of help to us, and they can help answer questions about the project as we go along. Um, let's begin a little bit by explaining about Sisu Heritage. Um, I'm going to pass out some material. Unfortunately, I don't have enough for all of you. And the only key things that uh, we really need to pay attention to are a small package of photos. And this is kind of a low-tech presentation, so we're all going to have to share these photos. You guys don't get any. <laughs> I, did, I must have missed your Twitter on this. <laughs> I think you did. <laughs> Um, in terms of what we'd like to do today, let me give you a little background on this and heritage. Uh, I want to talk about uh, the St. Stephen House Farm, where it's located, uh, give you a sense of its historic importance. I want to give you a description of the building, uh, and also a history of the project, which is uh, kind of interesting. And then uh, a description of some of the uh, stabilization and restoration work that has already been completed and that which we're working on to get funding and they're part of our three-year perspective of this project. <clears throat> and the last thing I'd like to share with you are the uh, some of the challenges associated with uh, working on a project like this, uh, which I thought might be of interest to you. Briefly on Sisu Heritage, uh, we were incorporated in uh, 1987. Uh, as I mentioned, we are an historical society. We're an affiliate of the St. Louis County Historical Society. Um, in contrast to uh, some of the other affiliates, the other local historical societies, our origins, origins are a little different. Uh, we really were hatched as an economic development group, not an historical society. If you uh, are around in the 1980s, you may remember this was a very, very challenging uh, period for the steel industry, challenging for reserve. Uh, Embarrass's population went from about 1,000 to 700. Uh, and so people got together and said, what do we do to help sustain and save this community? And one of the things that hatched out of this was uh, system heritage. I mean, basically, the idea was to take advantage of uh, heritage tourism. And we were able to acquire some historic structures. We established a great relationship with the township. Um, and so today we have a couple of pieces of property that we own. We share some uh, activities with the township. And uh, briefly, the activities that we're involved with uh, include our fair, which we have, fair or festival, which we have each spring. Uh, hopefully, many of you have been down to. Um, we also have uh, been involved in running tours. Uh, and one of our probably uh, most noteworthy accomplishments was the publication of our Impressions of Embarrass, which is our 100-year centennial book, which we're pretty darn proud of. Uh, lots of Ely connections, by the way, to this whole project, which I must mention. Uh, they begin with uh, Leon and Matt. Uh, but Alex Saitnimi, when he first came to the United States from Finland, uh, appears to have come to Ely first uh, and began his uh, adventures in the United States uh, somewhere around uh, 1902 or 1903, we believe. The, uh, let's talk about the structure. The, uh, the building is located actually in Wassa Township on Comet Road. About uh, four miles off of Highway 21. This is between Babbitt and Embarrass. And if you know, uh, as a reference point, Mike's Repair Service 
nice big white sign out there. While the road, just as you're heading to the west, just before Mike's repair service, is Mammoth Road. If you want to see the structure, uh, you drive to the end of Comet Road. It's about four miles. And you'll find uh, this beautiful 80-acre site, which still has open fields, uh, surrounded by uh, really nifty forests. So it's a beautiful site with this stately building on it. Um, the building itself, we believe, was constructed uh, in two phases. 1905 or 1907 was the beginnings. Um, Alex, Alex Satanimi came from uh, a city in Lapland. We think this was roughly 1903, 1902. He was uh, naturalized in 1904. Uh, we're not sure of all of his adventures. We do know he spent some time in Ely, worked in Tower. Uh, in the uh, 1910 census, uh, in Embarrass says that he was living at a farm which contained had borders uh, called the John Kangas property. A property, by the way, is still around. That's our bed and breakfast in Embarrass, which still flourishes today and has been uh, neatly restored, so that's a treasure by itself. Anyway, John, or Alex said maybe was a boarder in that uh, 1910 census. So he wasn't living on the site of his house barn, and we assume it was under construction. Uh, the fact that it was built in two phases we don't quite understand, although one of the things we learned recently is that uh, Alex went back to Finland uh, and came back the United States in about 1909. So he's gone for a year or so, we, we believe. Uh, that may, have, uh, may account for the delay in the uh, construction, we're not sure. Um, he uh, was about uh, in his early 30s when this building began. He was born in 19, or 19, 1875. Uh, he was married. He married a woman here in Embarrass, uh, Sophia. And they had uh, three children. The children were all born uh, roughly in the mid-teens, 1915, 1916, 1917 time frame. The uh, construction of the house itself is uh, pretty unique. It's a house barn. And there aren't many house barns in the United States. Uh, some of the research suggests that uh, there probably are only only 25 to 30 house barns that were constructed in the United States. Most of them were constructed by Germans or Czechs, interestingly enough. Uh, many of those were in the Midwest, Nebraska, South Dakota, North Dakota, a few in, in Iowa. So house barns as a concept for an agricultural endeavor were not very common. Uh, the, this particular building, just a uh, out of those 25, most of them are gone, I assume? Um, probably about uh, 20 of them survive in one form or another. Oh. And that reflects an early interest in barns, that you know, barns caught people's fancy. And people quickly recognized that house barns in the United States were pretty rare. So there's actually been a fair amount of preservation work. Now, when you, when you tie the Finnish connection, there are only three barns, three house barns, that were built by Finns. And, uh, Alexander Safe Navies is the only one in the state of Minnesota, uh, and the only one still standing. So that's why this is a rare structure and one that we really uh, appreciate having an opportunity to work Many with. Many were built, were framed rather than long. That's correct. Um, yeah, just to emphasize, the other, two, the other two, by the way, built by Finns were, as you might guess, were built in the Upper Peninsula. Uh, and one of those, if you want a real detail, was actually disassembled and rebuilt uh, in Wisconsin. Unfortunately, it burned down uh, about 20 years ago. The uh, historic importance of the building uh, was recognized uh, in the 1980s. And the building was officially placed on the National Historic Register in uh, 1990. Uh, there was some restoration work done at that time, or I'm going to say basically minimal maintenance work. Cecil so Heritage got some people together and they did some things to help sustain the building. Unfortunately, nothing was done during this uh, period until we started uh, last year. So there was no maintenance on the building. 
Um, to the uh, credit of the architects, uh, it was in remarkable, remarkable shape, given the fact that so little maintenance was uh, given to the building uh, in all of these years. The uh, house barn concept, uh, as we understand it, was not even very popular in Finland. <laughs> Uh, so the question is that we kind of wrestle with from time to time, where did this guy get this vision that I'm going to construct a building like this? He came from an area of Lapland that had uh, some agricultural base to it. Uh, we've been able to identify no other house barns in, in Lapland, or particularly in the community where Alexander was from. Uh, one of the interesting pieces of research we had was a, uh, a book that uh, actually described uh, agricultural barns and homesteads in this area of Finland, and looking at about 40 pictures, there aren't any house barns. And yes? Would this be a building uh, where the animals are down and the people up, or they're side by side? Side by side. We'll get to explaining the pictures, okay. uh, and I think I, I'll do that right I now. Sure. Um, we'll pass these around. Now, this is challenging everybody. Yeah. This is the house barn as it was uh, looked, we think, in the early 1920s. And we guess that that's the early 1920s because we can kind of look at the little children, the three little children, and that probably accounts for Knut, Bill, and Lydia. And those were the three state baby children. So anyway, we see the three children. Now, as I mentioned to you, the building was constructed in two phases. And the phases are really kind of divided into bays. So at the, this side of the building was the actual house. And next to it was the horse barn. And the horse barn and the house were constructed at the same time, roughly this 1907 period. And uh, the combination of those two structures is roughly 25 by 40. All the logs are tamarack. Uh, all of the boards and so forth uh, are tamarack. And uh, the inside of the house was a very common uh, design for a Finnish homestead. Basically, an open first floor and an open second floor. And there was a stairway that went up to the first floor. Uh, and the uh, interesting today, one of the corners, this little southwest corner of the building, has uh, the remnants of something that we've called, or is called in Finnish uh, heritage, a God's Corner, which was a place where you put important papers from your Bible, for example. And they're still a little covered that has survived all these years. The um, house barn, uh, or the horse barn portion of it, had a hayloft on the second floor. Um, and we were guessing that that was used as a horse barn for a number of years. Also probably was a source where uh, calves were placed in the wintertime. The Satanimis were uh, typical of Finnish farmers in that day where they farmed in the summertime and they were loggers in the wintertime. <coughs> Combination of farmer loggers. The next two bays uh, are really on the, on the second floor, an extension of the hayloft. So what this building ended up with was a hayloft that covered the horse barn, this little area below it called the manure handling area, and then the area that covered the cow barn. And um, the uh, cow barn is, um, we, we believe, was really the principal economic driver of the farm for many years. Uh, there were stanchions in that barn uh, for roughly 13 or 14 cows, which uh, in the teens and into the 20s, Fort Barris was a uh, big time, big time dairy operation. Um, and says that the uh, Satanimis were very successful farmers. If you look at the amount of area they had for hay, also suggests that they were successful. Uh, there was also, in addition to that hay storage on those two bays, there is at least one known structure, a hay structure out in the field, which the Finns were very commonly built. Uh, so anyway, we think that the states and Amis were pretty successful farmers. Uh, we also know that uh, their crops included oats, 
uh, obviously hay. They were also produced rye. And then we've learned uh, that in later years, meaning the 30s and 40s, they raised cheese. And we have a wonderful story of a, a various woman who we called going to visit the St. Denis as a young child and uh, bought mittens from the St. Denis, and that was, these mittens were made from wool from the farm. Um, the products that were sold, uh, I mentioned the, the St. Denis were loggers, they sold pulpwood, it was th sold through a, a cooperative uh, in Embarrass that uh, handled pulpwood. Their creamer, the, the cream was sold through a creamery cooperative in Embarrass. So the Finns were typically taking full advantage of the cooperative structure that had uh, been put in place by them. The uh, a little bit about the history of the project. This is a project that uh, somehow all the pieces uh, seem to be put in place. This of Heritage by itself is a pretty modest organization. While I think we're very proud of the things that were done, taking on a project of this nature was way beyond something that we would normally expect to do. And we normally would have a budget uh, for our events of, let's say, fifteen to twenty thousand dollars. So for us to think about a uh, restoration project that over a number of years might be three hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars. Some people would say you ought to have your head examined. But but the interesting exciting part is that things have fallen in place and we've had the good fortune to have uh, some people involved. So I mentioned no no restoration, no maintenance work since the early nineteen nineties. Um, Bill Satan Amy died in uh, two thousand and three. Uh, his heirs, there were some nephews and nieces, uh, thought that they were going to make a fortune selling the house barn because it was really valuable. Um, well, many people didn't recognize the value, and it was actually then sold at a fairly modest price to a couple here in Ely, Carol and Larry Schaefer. And uh, the Schaefers uh, bought it because it was a marvelous hunting property. What a great place to hunt. Uh, they, had some, they have some boys and they love to hunt that property and there may be somebody out there today. Uh, but Larry and Carol called us and said, gee, you know, uh, we understand that this building might have some historic value. Uh, can you tell us about this? And so we went out and visited with them. And um, the Schaefer said, look, we love this property. We think it's beautiful. We don't know what to do with this building. How about if we give it to you? Give it to you. And so uh, they did, and we have a, uh, on the building, we have a 99-year lease for about 50 feet around the property and access to it. And they have been uh, just marvelous to work with, just marvelous to work with. Uh, so they enjoy the property, they enjoy watching the construction and providing some supervision, but they're tremendously helpful and very proud of the building that they've uh, given to us. But it's one of those things where for the Schaefers, we wouldn't be talking about this project today. I have to give a couple of kudos to Leon. Uh, Leon uh, lives uh, west of town, uh, and she became a part of the System Heritage Board uh, six years ago, Leon. Longer than that? Okay. Uh, time flies when you're elderly. Um, <laughs> She became a part of our board because she was interested in, in general, some of the restoration work that uh, we were involved with. When we decided as a board that uh, we were going to take this project on, or at least explore that it was worthwhile undertaking, uh, Leon said, you know, I have professional credentials as an historic preservationist. Why don't you hire me to put together something called a historic structure report? And it took uh, the board a very short time to say, we'll do that. So Leon produces this book, which is a, uh, I think, a fairly classic historic structure report, which really describes the building, lays out all the things we do to do on a remedial basis, uh, lays out a, a, a blueprint in terms of uh, restoration work, gives us some sense as to how much it's going to cost, uh, and it's really the basis for any kind of funding request. And uh, you know, in Natalie Leon, we wouldn't have this high quality document for sure. So we were fortunate to have Leon in place. Uh, and then we uh, were very fortunate to be able to take advantage of uh, these legislatures 
legacy program. So we have a, had a, had a, a grant of about $60,000 to start our restoration process. Uh, we've also had some funding from the IRRRB. Uh, and we've also had smaller grants uh, that have really been important to us. And one thing nice about those smaller grants is that they really represent uh, the nation. So there's an organization based in Washington, D.C. called FinSpar. Well, FinSpar thought enough of that project to give us a thousand bucks. The Finlandia Foundation uh, also has been supported. Uh, Lake Country Power has been supported. So we've had a pretty good, uh, really smaller support as well as larger grants. The uh, work from our legacy grant uh, began about a year ago. Uh, and it began, our initial work was with a contractor from uh, Cotton and Ray Earth, and uh, Ray uh, undertook uh, this phase one stuff, and I'm going to briefly tell you what all that is. Uh, the stabilization work was designed to basically stop any further deterioration of the building and to make it safe to work on in the future. So there were some basic things done, like boarding up all the doors and windows, how to make it weatherproof. Uh, we had a really careful cleanup of the project. Uh, all those cans of oil and some other substances that were fun to be handling. Uh, that work was successfully cleaned. We were able to alter the elevations around the building. Have uh, somebody come out with a bobcat for a day, and lo and behold, you have a much better drainage. Than you uh, and just kind of basic in terms of exposing the foundation and preventing for further deterioration. Uh, another major task we had was uh, assembling the logs. I mentioned these are all Tamarack logs. Uh, and that, in, in a sense, turned out to be a pretty major uh, challenge. But again, sort of illustrative of the fact that things fall in place. The uh, contractor that I mentioned that is involved in this first phase work says, I know a logger down in Cotton. He'll get us the logs, and I'll haul them up for free, and he'll give them to us. Well, good deal. Unfortunately, the weather last year didn't, uh, did not facilitate harvesting uh, tamarack. Uh, so in December, we get a call. This logger isn't going to get in here this winter. You don't have any tamarack. And it was fairly important to get those tamaracks soon so that they could begin the peeling and drying process and we could work on it this summer. So I really had to hunt to find some resources. Um, and lo and behold, they ended up kind of in our backyard. Some of you may know the GNR greenhouse in Barris, the Rample family. Uh, well, behind that greenhouse was a stand of tamaracks. Gary and Sharon Rantlow said, well, geez, you know, is there anything back there that might be worthwhile to uh, harvest? And uh, lo and behold, there was. Not the greatest stuff in terms of straightness, and there's some that had rot in them, but it's provided us with uh, a great start in terms of assembling the tamarack that we we're going to need for your restoration work. And we were able to uh, get that as a donation, and then some local people handled the harvest at uh, low cost handled the trucking to the site at low cost. So there was some big time uh, donations there. And now we're uh, in the final phases of assembling the tamarack. We didn't get all that we needed. We now know better what we need actually because of the restoration project. So anyway, we concluded this uh, stabilization work uh, in June. And one of the things that was uh, nice about this work was that we were able to accomplish some things that we really didn't anticipate. We got a really good head start on the foundation work, and so most of that is complete. We were able to rebuild the root cellar, which is a very fundamental part of this house. It covers the, almost the whole uh, area underneath the house. It's a very large root cellar. And it was basically rocks on the ground. And so we were able to reassemble it, and we found some people that knew how to do it, and it's been beautifully reconstructed. Uh, the other piece of good fortune was hiring Matt. Um, and we were able to extend this phase one work because we began the process of replacing seal blocks. And so uh, I'm not sure how far we got around, but we replaced some seal blocks that we had no idea we'd be able to get to in the first work. As we did that, we worked the foundation underneath it. 
And we started the process of strengthening, strengthening, straightening the building. So uh, the roof line over the house and horse barn, uh, pretty straight right now. Uh, if you look at a couple of the north walls, pretty straight. Um, so that was a piece of uh, great having Matt, and we were able to stretch our dollars for this grant to be able to do something like this. So now uh, we're working on funding to find the uh, to work on the, the second or third phases, uh, and it's <coughs> it's it's tough to define phases these days. <laughs> I have something written down in that little handout, but they kind of run together. Uh, but they uh, include uh, some of the things that are kind of basic to the structure. As you'll notice from this picture. You'll see that this uh, barn area had earth ramps to it. And there was a ramp on the north side and one on the south side. And this was a really efficient way to get all this hay up to the second, halo, the second floor halo. <coughs> well, one challenge is to replicate these ramps. So we'll fix the earth base for them and then build the, uh, the log connecting uh, areas to the building. So that's another major piece. We have a uh, Roof work. This building uh, was pretty unique in the sense that it was built with a steel roof. No cedar shingles for this guy. He was really building a high quality building. And so from the beginnings, it was covered by uh, steel. Unfortunately, the steel has gotten tired and uh, will be entirely replaced with a major piece of work. All these windows, all these doors will be rebuilt. Uh, the building, it's hard to tell here, but if you look at this building pretty carefully, you can see that there is a siding over the logs. You can't see the actual logs. Uh, again, this was somewhat unusual. It was very common for the Finns, once they got some money, to cover their houses, their log structures, with lap siding. So if you go down to Barris or a place where these buildings still survive, you'll see a lot of them. can't tell if they're log structures or not because they have lap siding on them. Well, the state Navy has actually installed this lap siding immediately as they finalized the construction of this house barn. Um, and as you can see here, they also were pretty spiffy about painting it. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't see many buildings that have this nice white trim. We think some of it was red as well. Uh, but pretty interesting in terms of the care that went into finishing this building uh, and really making something that I'm sure the family was immensely proud of. The uh, couple of the highlights of the, the building itself, uh, the, uh, the cow barn area, as I mentioned, had stanchions for about uh, anywhere from 12 to 14 animals. And in those days, uh, it was fairly typical for the animals to be uh, indoors during the wintertime. You didn't turn your dairy out, herd out, and bring it in. They, they basically spent time inside. Uh, and the Safe Navy designed a pretty unique system for handling all that manure. Uh, not just the simple gutters, but also gutters plus some chutes that were able to allow the manure to be relatively easily moved to that manure handling area in the center. Uh, and I think uh, most of our vernacular architect friends would say, not seen anything quite that sophisticated uh, and well designed. And for these small Finnish farmers, uh, manure, by the way, was a very, very important product. So it was handled very carefully, and uh, it always went back and was recycled in the field. But it was very carefully handled in the springtime and uh, a resource to uh, be used uh, effectively. The other interesting thing about the cow barn is it has a watering system in it. Uh, and this watering system, you have to remember, there's no electricity in Amaris until the late 40s. So the barn itself had a, a dug well, which was not so uncommon, but it was a source of water for his cows. Uh, but they had a, about a 1,000, 1,500-gallon stock tank up on the second floor, which is, if you start thinking about the weight of uh, all that water up there, a uh, lot of weight. Anyway, there's a piping system to get it up from the well to this stock tank up there, and then piping systems to go to each one of these stanchions where you'd have an animal. And it had one of these uh, little control uh, pieces that the cow drops her nose on there and water appears in a little dish. Pretty common today in barns, but weren't so common 
uh, many years ago. So uh, he uh, was a pretty creative, thoughtful guy in his uh, agricultural endeavors. How do you keep that water from freezing? Well, you got to figure that uh, it was probably a challenge, but if you have your animals in the building, in the building. <coughs> uh, they're going to generate a lot of heat uh, and probably enough if it was full to uh, keep that water thawed during most of the winter time. Well, and the water tank itself was surrounded with uh, sawdust. It was, it was an elevated water tank, and they had a, a sawdust wall built around it, and I'm pretty sure they probably would have covered the top of it also. They had a wood cover as well. Ice house in reverse, yeah. It, yeah. <laughs> Did he have any... Uh, uh, piping all the way over to the horse barn? No. Uh, there wasn't well in the horse barn, and so we assume this was kind of a typical bucket deal uh, where the horses were watered uh, inside with buckets or outside with troughs or stock tanks. Um, How was the tank filled? Was a hand pump? Or? Yeah, it was a hand pump, so you, had, you not only had to get the water drawn out of your well, and we, if, I think it was a dug well, maybe 15 feet deep, uh, but you still had to have enough pressure to get it up to the second floor. Uh, and again, this is before electricity. Yes? Was there piping to the house from that water? Was there, no. Were there, heat, were there heat passages from the house to the barn? No. Totally. No. Okay. The, uh, let me go back to a little bit of the history of the barn. So yeah, this, the, the whole concept of a house barn is to take advantage of heat generated by livestock to uh, heat your house. Although you might, if you were a farmer, you might say, well, gee, those horses probably appreciated the heat that they were getting from the house. So it's a two-way heat exchange that's uh, of some value, particularly if you're working those horses in the wintertime doing logging work. So it was of some value. And the other part of the house part of construction, which is the obvious one, it's just plain fewer, fewer walls to construct. So there's a great efficiency in that uh, concept. Um, the state team has built a frame house on the property in the early 20s. And they moved from the house barn to this uh, frame house, I guess maybe 1923 or 1924. And there's a picture of a, in the packet of, that I passed around. You can see a picture of Bill Satney sitting on the porch of his uh, house. And you can see the house barn in the background. The, uh, we're not sure exactly how the house was used after the frame house was constructed, but we, uh, we have a pretty good idea that it was probably used as a bunkhouse. This house was big enough that, or this house, this farm, <coughs> the logging activities were big enough probably to support hired people. And we do know that the uh, 1920 census, when the states and were all living on that property, they do show uh, a boarder uh, living there with them. And Clearly, the house barn itself would be the ideal place to, uh, to have a board, to have a border on and have a higher help. But again, the size of this operation, this was a successful uh, farming operation. And for those of you who don't know it, actually, there was a period of time when Averis had a bunch of successful farms. They're all uh, 40 to 80 acres. Um, as time progressed, they moved from potatoes to dairy operations. Um, they were all built in conjunction with the co-op system. Uh, and they were all quite successful. Uh, farming disappeared in uh, Embarrass, except for some of us, uh, in the 1940s. And that was, unfortunately, the time that electricity came, but also came for some new, new rules with regard to milk handling. And uh, most of these farmers could not afford the investment in milk handling and just said, that's the end of my dairy operation. And then, as you know, in the 1950s, uh, something called Pacanite came around. And uh, so the whole character of Embarrass uh, changed quite dramatically, and it grew from a community of roughly five or 600 to well over 1,000 at one time. Steve? Were all these farms cleared from black spruce logs? Uh, some of them for pine. Uh, so the, uh, the condition, if you go back to the early 1900s when the influence Barris was uh, incorporated in 1905. The beginnings go back to, uh, it is a railroad stop in the, around 1884, 
but most of the most of the immigration occurred in the early uh, right after the turn of the century, and the condition of the land was forest, you know, low quality forest. All the big pine had all been harvested. Uh, the black spruce, tamarack stuff, uh, and pulpwood was still a crop, um, but it was mostly stumps and rocks. And the uh, you know the rule of thumb was that if you could uh, clear a half an acre per year, that you were making progress on your own state. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, this is horses, kids, wives, and uh, relatives who were really establishing these things. So you got to understand the word sisu, and <laughs> it really reflected in the, uh, the development of these little farms. There's a story about one of the most successful farmers, I don't know the name of it, that have been the Kangas family. They got to two acres per year. They had a lot of children. Um, <laughs> uh, but a half an acre per year to establish these things. Now, once these were going into the 20s, and even in the 30s, they did quite well. Um, one other comment about the cooperative system. Uh, it was uh, so successful and driven in many cases up in our Ryan Range here by Finns that many people believe that those farmers were able to survive the Depression because they had this kind of linkage. They weren't farmers on their own that suffered some of the traumas that farmers in Illinois, Iowa, Nebraska had. They had these guys had the benefit of the system. And so if you had pulp with itself, you knew how to do it. Uh, if you know how to acquire materials, they came from your cooperative. Um, were the, uh, the communists party involved in any of this? Well, of course. I'm going to get to yeah. that story right okay. now. Okay. <laughs> uh, one of the fun things about learning about the state Navy family, in which if you're from embarrassed, most people know that the state Navy's were hard communists. And so if you went up, uh, the first time I ever visited the state Navy household, which I guess was in maybe 1994, 1995, you went up on the second floor of that house, it was filled with the trunks and papers that the parents had brought over with them from Finland. And most of those trunks and papers had communist materials in them. So Lenin was a big star, Karl Marx. Uh, and the Satan Amis were uh, ardent communists. They were also very successful farmers. So there's a couple of interesting stories I'll share with you about that. There's a local fellow named Harry Lampa, who some of you may know. Harry's a former teacher and a reasonable historian in his own right. So Harry tells the story about, he's maybe 20 years younger than Bill Satini. Harry says, boy, when I was a kid, we used to go out and hunt on Bill's property. Every fall, there's a big deal to do this. And I really got a kick out. So I went out there with a couple of my brothers and my cousins this one day, and we get to the farm, and Bill has a brand new pickup. And Harry says, uh, Bill, you're quite the capitalist. <laughs> <laughs> and, this, and the true story is that that was the end of Harry's friendship. <laughs> and never did he hunt on the property again. <laughs> so that's how strongly he felt. The, the other, other, uh, other aspect of the intensity of that feeling is a, a letter I got. Uh, there was a story about this project in the Duluth News Tribune last year. A couple relatives wrote me. And I got a letter from a guy who is a grand nephew, I think. His name is uh, John Kangas. Yeah, going back to that Kankas connection in, in uh, Averis. And so he writes about how he went out to visit the safe things. And uh, he goes and he's talking, he's the guy, he must be in his middle or late 80s. Uh, so he talks about a couple of visits out there. He always enjoyed going out there because they had wonderful coffee and cool. And uh, they also had lots of political discussions. So this guy, Kankas' father, worked for the co op in Duluth for its superior. Uh, and this was probably one of the largest, <coughs> most successful supply co-ops in the country. A business based not only in Minnesota and Wisconsin and Michigan, but really all across the country. Well, this guy worked there. And so he got discussing at the coffee dinner table uh, a program that the Soviet Union had been interested in starting in the late 20s and 1930s. Basically, the Soviet Union wanted to sell bonds. These were not great times in Russia from the Soviet Union. So they were going to sell bonds to American co-ops. <laughs> okay? So there was a, uh, a portion of 
of uh, the Finnish population who were Reds and just thought this was a wonderful, wonderful idea. We're going to do this. And there were a portion that said, not so good. Well, Kangas's father worked for this co-op and they said, gee, it's a terrible idea. And of course, he expressed that opinion. And they still continued to come, but their relationship was not quite so warm. So he writes this letter saying, you know, when Bill died, I really did expect it to be mentioned in his will. <laughs> and he says, I wasn't. I have to believe it was because of those conversations about the Soviet bonds. <laughs> uh, but anyway, part of the fun of this building is learning about this family. Uh, the other aspect of the family is that uh, they were characters. Bill and his brother, kind of, uh, and everybody has, is older, has a story about these guys. And one of the stories was, of course, that they never got along. Never got along. And at one point, Bill moved across the road, built himself a cabin, and lived there for a, a number of years. Couldn't stay in the same house. This is after his mother and father died in the 50s. So he couldn't stay in the same house. So he built this little cabin. Of course, it's called The Good Life. <laughs> um, so they eventually got back into the house, but they had very separate lives. So if, if you were going to visit, let's say you were going to visit Bill, well, Knut probably wouldn't be there. And Bill would make sure that he made the coffee. You would be eating Bill's store if he was going to serve bread or something. Uh, very separate. If you're going to be Knut, the same deal. Bill wouldn't be there. Knut would serve your stuff. And they wouldn't get more. And this lasted uh, until their, uh, their death. So they're an interesting group of people, and uh, as I said, one of the fun aspects of working on this project is learning about this family, learning about their position in the community. Uh, it's very exciting. Um, I want to share with you just the last part of my presentation. I want to cover briefly, uh, go through these photographs if I might. This photograph, as I mentioned, was 1920s, and we judged that uh, by the newness of the building and by the uh, parent age of the children. We don't know, this building was taken somewhat after. It looks like a family gathering. Uh, it probably includes some of uh, Alexander's uh, nephews and nieces and maybe his sister's children. The building isn't quite so spiffy looking. Uh, we're guessing it maybe late 30s. This uh, photograph of Bill was uh, done in the uh, early 1990s. Interestingly, it was photographed by Deborah Sussex, who some of you may know. Uh, she, she was working for, I think, the uh, Masaba Daily News now, and did a freelance story about uh, Bill and his, his homestead. This picture uh, was taken about a year ago. This is when we were just starting our restoration work. Um, as you can see, it's kind of a cold October day. Um, can you show us? Because some of us don't have yeah, all oh, the sorry. here. Don't have. <laughs> yeah. Okay. okay. This is, again, about a year ago. Uh, and we'll get to a photograph here of what the building looked like this spring. And this is after the guys completed their work. Um, and a couple things that are noteworthy, you can see the sill log, sill log replacement here on the bottom. Oh, yeah. You can see that the foundation has been exposed and worked on. Was it just totally rock foundation? Yes, all, yeah, no more, and it's all dry rock. Dry rock. So uh, working those kinds of foundations is high skill. And uh, the other characteristic of them is that uh, the rocks vary from this big to this big to this big. So uh, watching people work on those rocks and resetting them is really, really fascinating to do. Anyway, so this is this spring. Uh, a couple other things you can see the roof is straighter. Yes? Why was the roof so large the size of the, it was the size of the structure or the size of the house? The size of the house itself. Uh -huh. The house but portion. Still huge. It was very large. And did they fill it? We assume they did, yeah. But even if you're talking about a sizable potato crop, yeah. uh, at least three kids and maybe some hired men and orders, you had real reason to fill that up. 
Uh, well, Matt and Leon can comment on that, uh, Bill. Uh, we would say that they were in remarkably good condition. Now, one of our projects, next projects, is really a replacement of some of these. That last siding that I referred to is now off, as you can see here. So we know exactly what needs to be replaced, and we have an inventory of what's a full log replacement, where are some partials. Um, we have an idea, we have a now modeling in terms of all the dovetails that need to be designed. This is all dovetail construction. Um, and so, as I said, part of our challenge now is to find ham racks of adequate size and strength, strength, which isn't so easy. The last photograph we have uh, is of looking at the built the house if you're standing on the northwest corner. And you can see uh, the work that has been done to strengthen that wall. Um, it's also interesting to look at the condition of the logs themselves. Yes, there's some replacement logs here, but as you can see, a lot of those logs are just fine. So uh, there was some really nice work done when this building was put together originally. Um, and you can see that pretty nicely here. That uh, area, as you might guess, is the entrance to the root cellar from the outside. And uh, one of our projects will be able to replicate the cover for that root cellar. So that's how it looks today and uh, as we begin our next phases of uh, construction. A couple things to wrap up. Uh, the uh, total cost of this project is about $300,000. We spent about seventy thousand already. Uh, we uh, are working large grants. We're also working hard at individual donations, and so uh, small donations are important to us. Uh, and it's also important in terms of being a vote <coughs> to those people who are seeking large grants from that says, "Hey, our community thinks these are this is an important project, and they're willing to put a buck in." So. Contributions, big and small, are important. Uh, given the dollar situation and the magnitude of the work, uh, we think this is work that hopefully would be completed in 2013. Um, talking about contributions, that uh, we've had some really nice volunteer contributions in terms of the cleaning of it. We had uh, a couple that came in one day, I think unannounced, that decided they were going to take all of the broken concrete uh, out of a horse barn and haul it in with their trailer and take it away. Mm -hmm. And they spent a lot of time and very, very hard work to do this. So this is, you know, this is volunteer work, um, A plus. Um, we have a, uh, some of you may be aware of Peterson well drilling. Uh, Norval Peterson says, you know, I really wanted to buy that property at one time. Uh, but I'll tell you what, I, I really, Really, I'm going to do something for you. I'm going to put a well in there for you. Wow. Mm -hmm. So, uh, in about two weeks, Normal is going to be out there with his crew, and uh, we estimate about 250 feet worth of well mm -hmm. for, for free. Mm -hmm. So, this is you know, an example of people pitching in and community support. Uh, so, thank you, Normal Peterson. Uh, let me just comment on the key challenges associated. Uh, one is obviously money, funding. And part of funding for us, we have learned, is really establishing some kind of an endowment for this project. So we have this thing completed. We have it useful. We have it a part of our community. We have it accessible to the public. But we need to maintain this thing over time. So we want to build an endowment, and hopefully we can begin working on that when our funding is more or less complete. We want to, uh, along with that endowment concept, uh, establish a long-term maintenance plan. Uh, we think when we're done with the restoration projects, we will have got done a lot to ensuring the life of the building for uh, another period of time. But these buildings desperately need ongoing maintenance. You can't stop maintenance in 1990 and expect to have a structure that's here 40 years from now. Um, we want to optimize the historic importance of this building. It is a house barn. It's clearly a unique house barn. We also want to do, uh, to optimize this whole concept of the Safe Navy family. Um, as we mentioned, they're an interesting group of people. Um, their political interests, the fact that Bill and Canute were 
characters, lots of stories to tell, and lots of ways to make sure that this building uh, has life to it that uh, people can identify with, that can be of interest to uh, schools uh, and others to be a part of our community. Um, so those are our challenges. Uh, <clears throat> thanks a lot for the opportunity to be with you today. Yes? Uh, Erwin Lathala, who lives across the lake here, whose late father Everett uh, is known to many, I suspect, mm -hmm. salvaged a number of uh, old Finnish log cabins, mostly in the Ameris area, one of which is our house, inside our house, and it was part of a house barn. Really? And we have pictures of that. It came from somewhere along Highway 21. So maybe you want to come see it someday. Absolutely. Absolutely. We'd love to know and, about and, that. And change your statistics. Huh? <laughs> well, there were at least talk two. Talk to Earl. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's um, So there aren't very many house barns. Right. So one of the questions is, why not? Why weren't there more, given the efficiencies? Yeah. And the other, maybe, maybe there's a second question, is what were the drawbacks to having a house barn? Well, one drawback that we know of that was uh, that many people believe is the reason that the frame house was constructed was fire issues. Uh, and some people say that you couldn't insure your barn if you had a uh, ch chimney fire system uh, adjacent to it. So as you can see, we had a uh, chimney system that was uh, right next to the horse barn. And so apparently people were so concerned that if you were in a remote area, remember the safety meetings are four and a half miles off of Highway 21, and mm -hmm. far from the volunteer fire department. So the fire insurance issue was one of the factors. Uh, the other factor, I'm not sure is an answer, but it's, it's, it's describing what was most typical. The Finns had a pattern when they were interested in agriculture of a fairly standard model of how their farmsteads should look, kind of built on this core of five buildings. You had a house, you had a sauna, you had a root beer, root cellar, you had a horse barn, you had a hay barn. And they were typically built in this U-shaped model. Mm -hmm. And if you, you, you've been, I think, to the uh, Hankel Farmstead, well, this is a good example of that kind of a model. And that model was so common that historic preservations would tell you that they could drive up to a farmstead and say, well, by looking at the, that configuration of buildings, I know this was built by Finns. Uh, so they had a model in mind in terms of how they wanted their farms to look. The other explanation is that, uh, that land was uh, much more available here in the United States. And so that you could spread out your buildings, kind of find that optimist, optimist relationship among your buildings in terms of being able to get around. Uh, and so you didn't have to worry about condensing your structure into one building. So that's one answer for, to your question, George. Yes? Have you considered or do you already have a, a custodian on site living there in terms of being that far off of Highway 21 in terms of vandalism or such things? Yeah. We don't have a custodian. We have uh, a group of volunteers that does the normal maintenance. And what, what can I say about vandalism? Um, we have other... Uh, farmsteads which we're responsible for. And over the years, we've had minimal vandalism in most of them, most of them. So as we began working more intensely on the safety naming place, uh, there were little or no signs of vandalism. Wow. The uh, Hanka place, which I mentioned to you, little or no signs of vandalism. I can't tell you the story about uh, the Pula property, which is in Embarrass, many signs of vandalism. Mm -hmm. This was a one of these deals that talk about being high tech uh, gets going on the internet that the place is haunted, right? Mm -hmm. So all the kids uh, find this a great place to go and uh, do what kids do. And some of that includes breaking all the windows in the barn uh, and some other things that cost money and affect insurance and so forth. So we're working hard to encourage or tell people that the place isn't haunted. Uh, don't go there. Uh, and as you know, with our sheriff policing system, it's pretty minimal, so it's hard to get their interests. Right. So I don't have an answer for you. We're, we are, in that case, the town of Embarrass is putting in a security system, mm -hmm. unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Yes? When you finish, will you put the um, lap siding back on? That's yes. the last part? Yeah. Just like they did? Yeah. I I, the siding, interestingly, was only on the west and the south sides. The west, when you drove up from the, the 
well, the current driveway, which has moved, I understand, and the south or the front side of the building. Hmm. And the framed part of the, the cow barn, the loft area, the second floor was framed, and that on the side there. But the back of the house, the back of the horse barn, and the lower part of the cow barn on the, the back side and the east side had no siding. Appearance. So. Yeah, absolutely. So appearance, but also appearance would, it have something, would it have something to do with the heat of the sun in the summer? Because I know our west and south are just blistering hot. Well, it, it might, but I think a lot of it has to do with appearances. You know, you, you, you put the side towards the public that looks good. <laughs> yeah, and I, I would comment, if you, uh, if you look at the log construction on the south and west sides, which are most likely to be subject to heat in the summertime, yeah. these are large logs, great insulation. Right. So adding, you know, a half or uh, inch of lap siding isn't going to improve. Uh, mm -hmm. It does It does prevent the wood from weathering. That, that's what I was Because if you, yeah. the north is not too bad, but the east side, the logs have weathered much more. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And it, it's kind of a problem on some of the logs. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't sound like much happened over time in terms of improving on it. So you don't really you don't really have a restoration point in time. Does well, it, yeah. Or do you? No, well, we do, but I'm not sure. It's, it's, it's probably imperfect. We basically want to replicate the building as it appeared in those two early photographs, um, which you know is obviously its uh, spiffiest shape, uh, and maybe you know at the beginnings of a prosperous period for the St. Amy family. It's been a very hard to track how the farm operation progressed over the years. I mean, just recently, we learned that they had a sizable herd of sheep. Well, we didn't know that. Uh, there are no signs of other outbuildings that might be an indication of that. But we do know young kid went and bought clothes uh, that were made by wool from the St. Amy sheep. So. Will that include the interior? Like, I mean, if you get more grant money, would you do the the uh, water tank and, yeah, and make absolutely. it operable so that yeah. you could see what it was right. like inside there? The whole concept of restoring the, car, the milking parlor uh, is on the list. So we'll have that our handling system, that watering system. We'll have all the stanchions back up. We'll have the little chutes that handle the hay coming down from the hayloft. Uh, so that's that's part of the, the key. Yes? So your your goal by 2013 is to have it in a, um, a condition that you'll be having <coughs> tours to the public and, and open on the inside? And oh yeah, but we have tours now. Oh, we do. Yeah, not so, everybody probably knows. Why don't you tell a little bit about that? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Do you charge for the tours? Um, yes. We do. What? Good. We have the tours are regularly scheduled during the summer months on uh, Thursday and Fridays, and they uh, are operated from the uh, building across from Four Corners in Embarrass, that information center. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I've forgotten what the charge is. Is it four dollars? It's pretty minimal. Yeah, it's a minimal it's charge. It's usually a two-hour tour or something. So uh, get a lot of the money. other way, which people have found to be very helpful, is then you could. But if you can't make one of those tours, you call up the township, or you call up me and say, "Gee, we have a group that'd like to come and uh, tour the properties," and that works well. We had a group of uh, I don't know eight or nine people up from Duluth uh, last Friday. So having special tours is uh, something we know how to do. We had a couple of busloads of tours from Minnesota Humanities Group this summer. So making the building accessible right now is, is important to us. We've also had open houses there this past summer during the Finnish American Festival in June and during the uh, Embarrass Fair in August. And I was there in and as well as we had uh, one of our, our other tour guides that works for Barris was out there for the June one also, um, most of the afternoon. Mm -hmm. It was a, just come on over. Yes. Uh, are you planning to use it just as a museum or also for certain events? Well, we haven't decided that. Uh, the idea of a museum is, is important, but I think uh, we would like to be <coughs> Uh, have it as the focus for some events. One of the things that we found uh, 
using our what we call the Nellemark Museum, uh, which is that white farmhouse that some of you go by on your way to Duluth. We, it serves as a museum. But one of the things we found is that if you uh, add some artisans to it, and they also have a farmer's market from time to time, <coughs> and you also have some community night outs there, suddenly this becomes a focal point. So we, we say to ourselves, well, gee, why can't we do the same thing, generate the same kind of interest uh, in the state community property? So I can't tell you exactly what we're going to do, but we know that it's going to be more than just the museum. And part of the reason for that is uh, the group that I was referring to that would visit us uh, last Friday was interesting because uh, I think almost all of them lived in Duluth. A couple of them were quite interested in history, knowledgeable people about history. Well, one of the things, and one of the comments that I walked away from uh, two and a half hours of those people is, oh, I never knew this kind of place existed. You know, we have this stuff in northern Minnesota. The same thing applies to Ely guys. <laughs> Do we have this stuff in northern Minnesota? They didn't know anything about it. And they're, you know, been around for a while. I know something about history. So were they truly impressed with this building? Yeah. And that's the kind of excitement we want to generate. I think the other thing, which uh, actually the Ely Winton Historical Society has done a pretty good job of, is to build a linkage with the schools. Uh, if you get people from Ely, Babbitt and Barris, uh, Aurora, and you get them engaged, it's, an, it's really an exciting way to get them triggered in terms of some interest in history. And a building like this, you know, it's different enough, it's stately enough, uh, the location is impressive, that will get the kids uh, thinking about uh, history in a different way. And the, the tour, though, includes, what, half a dozen different yeah. structures? Oh, so yeah. It's not good, just this. Good point, yeah. Steve.